Welcome to the Calcium Masterclass Series brought to you by Shockwave and Optima Education. In class four, we're here to teach you about insights into the mechanism of action of intravascular literacy and clinical applicability. I'm James Spratt, a professor in interventional cardiology, and I'm joined here in the studio by my colleague from St. George's Hospital in London, Simon Wilson. Simon will answer the question, what is a shockwave? Before we close the session with Ziad Ali, who will answer the question, how IVL is adapted for the vascular space. Thanks, James. In today's class, uh, Michael Yoner will take us through the pathophysiology of coronary arterial calcium, and Nadia Sutton will share some insights from basic science that translate into clinical practice. So we're gonna start this class with a talk on the pathophysiology of coronary arterial calcium. And I can think of no one better than Michael Yoner to take on this talk. Michael is one of the very few interventional cardiologists I know who's an expert both in interventional cardiology and also pathology. And what makes him even more unique is he's a great speaker. So great to welcome you to the class, Michael. No uh, pressure, but we're really looking forward yeah. to hear this. <laughs> you, put, you put me under pressure, definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much, James, for the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure, and uh, I'm delighted to be part of this series of uh, presentations and webinars. Um, so my task, obviously, is it to take you through the, <laughs> the dry material of, of theory behind the pathology of calcification, but I'll try to make it as um, clinically applicable to you as possible. So um, let's start with the first slide, and this is an illustration, basically, which is meant to show you the different stages of atherosclerosis. And you can see that it's colored in the more stable plug forms are colored in yellow, orange and the unstable plugs such as rupture, erosion and calcified nodule, what we're talking about is colored in, in blue. And it, it's also associated with the clinical stages of calcification. They can be either identified by histology, and you can see those um, stratified as non-micro punctate, fragmented, sheet-like or nodular calcification. And then there's also this classification by means of imaging that is for instance computer tomography OCT or intravascular ultrasound and this can be classified as non-spotty or diffuse calcification. You can also see on this slide that the calcium Agatston score is uh, clearly associated with age so it increases over time but it also shows one important thing is that calcium actually confers stability. That means when you look at the presentation and manifestation of acute coronary syndrome, you can see that this most often occurs during earlier stages of atherosclerosis and the later stages show more stable disease. And that is also um, uh, conferred by the calcification process. Now, when we talk about pathophysiology, we have to clearly distinguish intimal from medial calcification because they have different mechanisms. And you can see that there are systemic mechanisms, but also local factors and cellular factors. When we talk about intimal calcification, you can see that there are um, circulating stem cells involved. Um, the typical processes involved in atherosclerosis, such as oxidative stress, inflammation, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, and also some cellular factors, such as the presence of theoblast-like cells and the activation of parasites. And we'll talk about this in a minute. When we now look at medial calcification, we see a different uh, um, level of pathophysiology because here it's mostly related to the absence or loss of uh, mineralization inhibitors, such as um, lack of osteopontin, GLA protein, vitamin K, and others. You can also see that drugs can actually promote medial calcification. For instance, statins and warfarin are well-known uh, promoters of calcification in the media. And recently it has been described that loss of function in elastin is related to medial calcification. Now these are slides, or this is one slide showing the differences once more. Intimal calcification is associated with atherosclerosis and plaque vulnerability. It forms in association with vascular smooth muscle cells, macrophages, and the necrotic core. And it's common in coronary arteries, aorta, and peripheral arteries. And it's associated with luminal encroachment and downstream ischemia. On the other hand, you have medial calcification, which is not associated with atherosclerosis, and this is very important. And it's also more common in the aorta and peripheral arteries, as I will show you examples later on. It's not associated with luminal encroachment, at least not in the early stages, and it's associated with loss of the damping function and rise in pulse pleasure and indirect ischemia. 
Now, when we look at the pathogenesis of interval calcification, you know the two dominant cell types is vascular smooth muscle cells and macrophages. Already been discussed, vascular smooth muscle cells are associated with atherosclerosis and vulnerable, uh, plaque vulnerability, as I have already shown. It's important to understand that apoptosis of vascular smooth muscle cells results in microcalcification that can be seen under the microscope, but not by any means of imaging. It occurs usually within the intima, media, and the fibrous cap, while macrophages, on the other hand, they show a predominance of punctate calcification, and that is also due to their apoptosis, but it's more confluent, and this is why it's occurring in a punctate way. Usually, it occurs within the necrotic core. Now, here I'm showing you the different steps of calcification. I'll try to make it simple. It starts from microcalcification. And when we look at this von Cossa stain, which is a specific stain made for calcification, you can see this very intense um, stipulated black stain, which is calcium. And that can only be seen under the microscope, not by any means of imaging. Then, as we progress, we start to see punctate calcification panel B and C, and then as it progresses towards the outer rim of the necrotic core, close to the media layer, that's the first time when we start to see fragmented calcification. And this will even progress into sheet-like calcification at the point when the entire necrotic core is calcified, and that is seen, for instance, in panel G and E. Finally, these sheets can break, and that is what uh, provides the nodular form of calcification, uh, which can be seen in panel I. And finally, something really rare, but can be seen when you have long process of calcification occurring is something uh, similar to bone formation that can be seen in this vessels. Now, when we dive into the calcification scheme of radiology, that's much more simple. You can see that we have speckled or spotty calcification, which is followed by fragmented or even diffuse calcification, but there's much less diversity as compared to histopathology, and this has to be understood for the clinician. When we really want to compare them, uh, we need to make clear that we put them next to each other, and this is shown in the next slide. Um, calcification by radiography um, is again seen as speckled, fragmented, or diffuse. And when we look at histology, there's a much greater diversity of calcification. More so even, we can identify the underlying plaque type. And this is shown in this pie charts. When you look at those, you can see similarities between radi radiology and histology, but you can also see some important disparities. And that's mostly related to the fact that histopathology um, is enabled basically to detect much greater diversity of calcification and underlying plaque type. Now, an important association is the one between percent stenosis, which is important for the interventional cardiologist, and plaque type. That means the early stages of atherosclerosis usually show less narrowing, while the more progressive disease you have, you also greater the greater level of percent stenosis you will see. Importantly, this associates also with greater level of calcification as seen on the right-hand side. That means that those vessels which are severely stenosed also have a higher likelihood of showing uh, severe calcification. And Calcification can be a killer, indeed, as shown in this slide. This is a patient that died of sudden death from um, calcified nodule. And this is a, a study just recently published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology by the group of Rena Vermani. And she shows that basically calcified nodules can break through into the lumen and cause a tear thrombosis. And it's important to show that this occurs most often at the hinge points uh, between calcified sheets where the friction and the mechanical forces are maximal within the coronary artery. Most often that's at the sites of, of greatest tortuosity and bending. Now let's take a deeper look at progression of atherosclerosis and calcification, especially the calcified sheets because this is important for the interventional cardiologists to understand, basically. Calcification generally progresses into the surrounding area of the necrotic core, which leads to the development of sheets of calcification where both collagen matrix and necrotic core are calcified. And then if, we, if it further progresses, you start to see nodular calcification. It may occur within the plug in the absence of luminal thrombus and is characterized by breaks in calcified plates or those sheets that I have shown previously with fragments of calcium separated by fibrin. Because you have these fragments moving um, in the artery, you can see deposition of fibrin that can cause also thrombosis. <clears throat> 
Now, the next slide shows the risk factors associated with either intimal or medial calcification. And you can see there is some overlap, but also disparity. Um, you know, the well-known uh, risk factors of uh, atherosclerosis, such as advanced age, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, etc. And you can also show that medial calcification is much more related to renal etiology, uh, advanced kidney disease, etc. And this is very important to understand. Now, the central cell type that we have already discussed without any doubt is the vascular smooth muscle cell. And it is understood that even under physiologic conditions, vascular smooth muscle cells remain um, with a substantial pleiotropy. That means that they can differentiate into different other cell types, such as osteoblasts or, some, uh, or chondrocytes um, cell types. This um, is exaggerated and enhanced in the presence of chronic kidney disease, diabetes, aging, et cetera. And this is why we need to understand that there's a disbalance towards uh, mineralization in the, in the presence of disease. Um, lipids are also play a very dominant role. Um, oxidized lipids, you can see, they elicit procalcific effects in vascular cells. And what was found out that it's not only the high level of LDLs, but rather the dyslipidemia uh, itself that uh, is related and a, a causative factor in vascular calcification. Now, I have already talked about the different cell types, vascular smooth muscle cells, also referred to as osteoblast-like cells, or macrophages referred to osteoclast-like cells. And that is important to understand that there's a disbalance between these two cell types vascular smooth muscle cells, which cause vascular calcification by producing mineralization, and the macrophages, which are defective actually in later stages of atherosclerosis, and therefore you see less resorption of mineralization, and this is why this disbalance um, um, is uh, been exaggerated in the during disease progression, and this is why we see more and more vascular calcification during atherosclerosis progression. Now let's take a closer look between intimal and medial calcification because it is important to understand these differences. Um, medial calcification has different risk factors, as I have shown, and different implications for the uh, clinician. It's also called Monkeberg's calcification. It, the calcium deposits in the media, not in the intima. It's non-occlusive most often, and it occurs preferentially uh, in the elastic fibers of the internal elastic lamina. Um, it's clear that it results in decreased vascular compliance. As you can see at this Doppler waveforms, you can see that it's actually narrowed. Uh, there's a reflected waveform and the systolic pressure is increased. And that is all a result of the uh, lack of compliance in the vasculature. I am showing you now two um, representative examples to make it clear um, what is the difference between Mönckeberg's medial calcification and intimal calcification caused by atherosclerosis. On the left-hand side, you can see medial calcification. You can actually see bone uh, formation within the medial layer, and that can be detected by optical coherence tomography. It causes stiffening of the artery, but it does not cause severe luminal narrowing, and that's important to note. The intima is free of disease in this particular case. While when we look at atherosclerosis at the right-hand side, you see narrowing of the lumen, and you can also see that calcification occurs within the intima, where it's more dangerous because it, because it can actually break through or cause mechanical stress and finally cause plaque rupture. Another example, um, and it's important to note that all of these are below the knee examples. The, the first one was from the uh, above the knee femoral artery. This is below the knee, uh, where it's even more common. And you see differences between atherosclerosis, such as fibroatheroma and TICFA. Um, and you can see on the right side of this first slide, Mönckeberg's medial calcification, which is strongly limited to the media and oftentimes does not penetrate into the intima. On the right side of this, uh, of this slide, you see um, uh, Munkeberg's medial calcification affecting a dorsalis pedis artery, and you can see that it's severely calcified the medial layer. And as you can also see with your own eyes, that it indeed in these very late stages, it causes luminal narrowing, um, but only in very late stages. So this final slide sums it up. It makes the point why medial calcification is different, but important to understand. The intima and the adventitial layer are quite intact. There's nothing to fear from these layers. But you can see that the medial layer is mostly gone and is occupied by a huge calcified sheet, which causes decrease in vascular compliance. And also, it may cause um, under expansion of, of stents, of coronary stents. 
So let me summarize this quickly. Calcification progresses with atherosclerosis and can be used as a surrogate marker of more advanced atherosclerosis. But importantly also, calcification confers plaque stability at the same time, since calcified necrotic core can no longer rupture and result in arterial thrombosis. Intima calcification is associated with atherosclerosis, while Monkeberg's medial calcification is limited to the medial layer. Systemic and local factors are involved in the pathogenesis of coronary artery calcification, where smooth muscle cells and macrophages play a dominant role. And likely, intravascular lithotripsy causes focal breaks in the calcium, which allows compensatory enlargement in the absence of excessive injury, which is oftentimes seen with other methodologies. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Michael, you didn't disappoint. That was perfect talk, <laughs> really clear, really systematic. Obviously, Simon and I aren't pathologists, we don't have your background, but the messaging was coming through very strong here. And I wanted to ask you about that truism that we understand that microcalcification is associated with plaque instability and congruent calcification is associated with plaque stability. And obviously yeah. that increases with time. So my question to you is, that's true on a population basis, but what about the patients who have erosive calcific nodules. Based yeah. on what you've told me, perhaps they're the most difficult ones to treat. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, we all know, and we have seen these patients in the cath labs, when you perform OCT, oftentimes you forget to do OCT and then you regret not to have done OCT because you suddenly realize that your stent doesn't expand no matter what you're doing. And oftentimes when you then go back and do OCT to understand why, you start to see this nodular calcification that is really extremely difficult to break with regular balloons, even high uh, pressure balloons, non-compliant balloons, um, extremely difficult. So in my opinion, it's very important to identify these nodular types of calcification beforehand and then use appropriate techniques to split those. Um, and I personally believe that um, lithotripsy is, is the most appropriate way because it causes much less injury to the artery as compared to all kind of debulking, uh, debulk, debulking techniques. And that, that's extremely interesting, Michael. And I think the other thing I found extremely interesting is this congruence between intravascular imaging and particularly OCT and pathology. And I wanted to ask you, because again, I can't think of anyone who'd be able to answer it more accurately. How, how well does that relate and how much can we extrapolate from what we see in OCT to the actual underlying pathology? Yeah, so uh, this is a good question because um, we have to also understand the limitations of optical coherence tomography. But the good news is that optical coherence tomography is extremely good in identifying calcium. That's obviously one of the strengths of optical coherence tomography. So I think we can clearly identify the sheet-like calcification and also the nodules. It is to be understood that sheet-like calcification is an important surrogate for a more dangerous form of calcification because it's one of the precursors of nodular calcification. So whenever you do a pullback and you identify sheet-like calcification, even in the media, even when the media is affected, you should also carefully look for nodular calcification, which can, you know, cause stent failure or a poor outcome, uh, also procedural outcome. So OCT does reflect the underlying pathology in a way, but what it cannot do, it cannot really dive deep into the underlying tissue. So let's say if you have a very large artery, proximal arteries, where you have calcification in the deeper regions, it's oftentimes very difficult to see or even impossible. So you need to understand understand also about your limitations. I think this is very important. And Michael, the final question for me is, you, re you mentioned nodular calcification a couple of times, and I think actually those of us working in this field are starting to understand that that's the real, the tough bit of calcium to treat. And you actually, we sh you yeah. showed us a, a mechanism of sudden cardiac death and nodular calcium. So any insights that you can give us in, when we're approaching this enemy, how, how, how can we get better outcomes? Yeah, so uh, this is indeed a very interesting uh, story. And uh, when I was working with Reno Mamani many years ago, uh, we looked at uh, these calcified nodules. And I can tell you even today, there's very little known about the pathomechanisms of, of calcified nodule. Obviously, it's already too late when you have calcified nodule because by definition, the terminology tells you that there's arterial thrombosis. So these are patients that present with acute coronary syndrome. 
And those are obviously the most difficult patients to treat because they present in acute coronary syndrome, either STEMI or non-STEMI, and you need to perform debulking uh, or anything else to, uh, to get flow to these arteries. So this is a combination that is most dangerous because you will have a high you know, um, activation of platelets and coagulation in the, in the, in the setting of, of an acute myocardial infarction. So I think it is important to actually treat these patients before it comes to uh, the breakthrough of nodular calcification. So imaging is the only way because fluoroscopy will never be able to tell you whether it's just, let's say, a safer form of calcification, sheet-like or nodular calcification. So imaging is the only way to do it. And in my opinion, also intravascular ultrasound is, doesn't have high enough resolution to tell you whether it's nodular or sheet-like calcification. So you clearly need to use OCT. That's the only way to identify it. And that, that's a great answer. And I'm going to turn this over to Simon, uh, Michael, because actually a lot of what you said there about nodular calcium and erosive calcium in the context of acute coronary syndromes, particularly ST elevation myocardial infarction, have been red signals, a red line for us for some time. Yeah. And we are actually just published our experience in ST elevation myocardial infarction of lithotripsy. And, and, and Simon, you know, the problem is that up to now, available technologies, as Michael has alluded to, are actually associated with other problems like, you know, heat activated platelets, you know, distal no reflow. So lithotripsy and ST elevation MI, is that a potential option? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, um, it avoids the problems uh, that we see with um, atherectomy in terms of, you know, excess heat, platelet activation, activation of the coagulation system. In STEMI, you've, you, almost inevitably, you've got some degree of microvascular obstruction already from downstream embolization. You don't want to add on top, you know, add to that with with atherectomy. So it's going to avoid that. But I think quite often when you see STEMI patients, they're either the often the sort of plaque rupture with a high thrombus burden, or they're these you know these patients that have a lot of calcium. You can just imagine already they had a severe stenosis there, and it's just precipitated over. You know they've already got a severe amount of calcium. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and those patients, I think lithotripsy is just, you know, is an absolute ch game changer there because it allows you to keep the, the original wire there. It's easy to use. It's quick. It's efficient. So in those patients, STEMI patients with a lot of calcium in the arteries, it's... It doesn't allow you to trash the, the distal microvasculature. Yeah. Listen, Michael, every time I hear you speak, I always learn a lot. And today was no exception. So a real pleasure to have you on board fantastic slides. I'm going to go back and listen to them again <laughs> and hopefully we'll meet up again soon and uh, good luck to you. Uh, that is very true. Hope to see you in person at some point. Yeah. Thank you so much. Next, we have Nadia Sutton from Michigan to help us understand how insights from basic science can translate into clinical practice. Nadia, welcome to the class. You're going to talk to us about uh, the pathogenesis of coronary calcium and how we should take that information and integrate it into our clinical practice. So, Real pleasure to have you here. Really looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's such an honor to, to join this um, webinar series. So as you mentioned, the, the title of the talk is Insights from Basic Science that Translate into Clinical Practice. Um, my name is Nadia Sutton. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the University of Michigan. Um, in the United States. And um, just gonna go ahead and start advancing the slides. So just as a bit of introduction, I'm going to be talking a little bit about coronary artery calcification, how and where it occurs, um, calcification as both a reactive and an active process, review some mechanisms of calcification, discuss some medications that sometimes can uh, potentially impact calcification and talk a little bit about some future directions. So, on the left-hand side, um, I actually have a cross-section of a patient that, um, uh, is a patient who I take care of in clinic who is a veteran who was exposed to Agent Orange and who actually has very heavy concentric coronary calcification. However, it's not actually causing obstruction. Um, and I think that this just kind of um, sort of leads into the discussion here about the, the many comorbidities that can lead to calcific coronary artery disease. And it's a bit unpredictable sort of where and to what degree it occurs. Um, for example, on the right-hand side is another patient um, I took care of who had a very calcified LED, but actually um, her ACS event was provoked by a lesion in her ramus, which was not a calcific lesion. 
So there's many morphologies of coronary calcification. Um, in particular, you know, the, the non-nodular forms, which um, you can kind of see the cast of a right coronary here in the upper panel, and then on the lower panel, um, more nodular coronary calcification. Um, the, the lower panel was actually from a patient who also presented with ACS, and actually I thought maybe it wasn't going to be such a calcified lesion because it was an ACS event, and then actually we ended up with a balloon rupture um, when we first went up with a, a low-pressure balloon inflation, um, and then subsequently found by intravascular imaging that it was very calcific and nodular. So here are some other sort of um, potential forms of calcification that you might encounter in clinical practice. So atherosclerotic calcification is typically more intimately oriented and eccentric and initiates at the base of the necrotic fibro fatty plaque. Um, it actually initiates via apoptotic vesicles, which arise from dead and dying vascular smooth muscle cells. So some major features of atherosclerotic calcification that differ from medial artery calcification include abundant fibrosis, extensive cellular necrosis, apoptotic body uh, formation, and cholesterol um, crystal accumulation. But it is also just important to um, to, to realize, I guess, that the calcification can really be a reactive process in reaction to mechanical strain, inflammation, reactive oxygen species, um, or local metabolites, um, or it can actually be a proactive process whereby vascular smooth muscle cells can actually acquire an osteogenic or calcigenic phenotype, which perpetuates um, arterial calcification. So, um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that vascular stiffening is um, really a very important sort of part of this process because um, vascular stiffening throughout life sort of leads to increasing peak systolic pressures, lower diastolic pressures, increased pressure wave um, amplitude, um, transmitted to runoff and microvasculature, and leads to an organ dysfunction. And, and Calcification is part of this, but it's not the, the only part. Um, it also involves increasing collagen, decreasing elastin over time, and increasing collagen covalent cross-linking. Um, there can be some vascular smooth muscle cell hypertrophy. Um, some of this can lead to um, some positive remodeling, which also contributes to, um, to vascular stiffening. So vascular smooth muscle cell calcification can be a reactive or a proactive process, as I mentioned. So um, vascular smooth muscle cells can really acquire phenotypes, which can be contractile, proliferative, um, migratory, or calcifying in response to their environment, um, which can include phosphate concentration, hyperglycemia, and inflammation. Vascular smooth muscle cells that um, acquire an active calcific phenotype will secrete microvesicles, which uh, concentrate calcium and phosphate to enable the formation of these extracellular hydroxyapatite um, crystals. And this is the chemical structure of calcium phosphate that's found in the vessel wall. So um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but the point of this figure is to really just demonstrate the common origin of vascular smooth muscle cells from mesenchymal st uh, stem cells, which can also form chondrocytes and osteocytes. Um, it's uh, also to demonstrate that there is defined transcription factors that lead to transformation of vascular smooth muscle cells into an osteogenic phenotype. So for example, on the right-hand side, um, these are actually some human coronary artery vascular smooth muscle cells that we grew in our lab. Um, we stimulated them with or without just a slightly elevated elevated phosphate um, media sort of reflective of what we might see in a patient with mild renal dysfunction. And we were able to demonstrate with alizarin and red staining theory, um, actually not without too much difficulty, that we um, can stimulate these cells to precipitate extracellular calcium. So importantly, there's abundant evidence that increasing vascular calcification occurs with age and it implies um, clinical outcomes for patients. So the degree of calcification can predict the likelihood of a coronary event. Um, it can also be very useful in if a patient actually doesn't have any coronary calcium. So I'm really not so worried about um, a patient who I see in clinic who I may have a coronary calcium score on in their, in their 80s or 90s and if it's zero, that's actually um, a very powerful negative predictor as well. So I wanted to talk through just a few potential mechanisms of vascular calcification, um, which remains really a very underexplored field. Um, so one, um, one area of interest is senescence. So um, you may or may not remember sort of from medical school that senescence refers to cells that are no longer dividing. Um, it can be triggered by um, telomere shortening or DNA damage. Um, and I used to sort of think of these cells as sort of um, bystander cells that weren't doing very much, but actually they're sort of like bad neighbors. Um, so they promote atherogenesis through through a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, they sort of actually sec secrete substances into their microenvironment that actually um, not only confer resistance to apoptosis, um, they can be dysfunctional, and they actually um, encourage their neighbors to also become senescent. Um, and so it's, it's very, I think it's actually quite interesting 
Um, and it, this is uh, some um, uh, very interesting cell culture data. Um, and there's also some um, sort of animal and um, translational human data to suggest that um, these increasing markers of senescence of vascular smooth muscle cells are associated with increased vascular calcification um, in that the, the vascular smooth muscle cells actually secrete, um, or, or sorry, are um, transcriptionally sort of um, focused on uh, becoming calcigenic. So additional data from models of aging using progeria models suggests that it may not be um, only the increase in procalcifying factors, but potentially the loss of anti-calcifying factors that um, actually lead to this process. So pyrophosphate um, or that uh, PPI, uh, for example, is a potent endogenous inhibitor of calcification. There's actually several models, um, both animal and human data, um, including humans that actually have genetic defects um, that um, impair um, pyrophosphate generation, um, the demonstrating the importance of this molecule in preventing vascular calcification. And it's also um, helpful to recall that bisphosphonates, which are the drugs that use, are used to prevent osteoporosis, are essentially pharmacological versions of pyrophosphate. So um, this is another really interesting um, sort of potential mechanism of uh, calcification that may occur with aging or with sort of factors that lead to at least um, uh, biologic aging, if, if not chronological aging, and that has to do with epigenetic modifications. So epigenetic modifications basically refers to um, changes in the DNA um, without necessarily changing the DNA itself, um, the sort of um, ultrastructural changes such as DNA methylation, um, post-translational histone modification, and potentially microRNAs that will actually regulate um, sort of gene expression. And um, it's, it's actually uh, quite, quite interesting, I think. Um, in fact, some of these um, sort of clocks of epigenetic mod modification have actually been shown to predict um, lifespan better than uh, chronological age. Um, but ultimately, there's um, some uh, preliminary data, at least, to suggest that these epigenetic modifications are actually also linked to vascular calcification um, and that sort of interactions between these microRNAs and molecules um, known to regulate vascular calcification have been described. So um, another um, uh, sort of thing I wanted to mention, as I, I think I mentioned previously, that um, it is important to note that diabetes is definitely also a risk factor for the development of coronary calcification. Um, because diabetes is often accompanied by um, renal dysfunction and aging, um, these processes tend to sort of accelerate um, simultaneously and, and exponentially. So there's um, several putative mechanisms by which vascular calcification might be stimulated by hyperglycemia um, and diabetic patients. So one of these is the idea that glycated proteins essentially result in intracellular signaling, uh, which turn on transcrip uh, transcriptional machinery that stimulate vascular smooth muscle cells to become osteogenic. Um, and on the flip side, um, there's some soluble inhibitors of these glycated proteins that may play a protective role and are inversely related to vascular calcification and stiffness. So um, the important point from this slide is really that um, renal dysfunction results in many accelerators of vascular calcification. Um, oftentimes there um, may be increased phosphate, which results in vascular calcification and stiffness, re resulting in hypertension. Um, and of course, um, these are sort of things that we see very commonly in patients who have end-stage renal disease and, and are on dialysis. They also may have increased inflammation as a result of being on dialysis, um, increased oxidative stress. All of these things sort of, again, um, kind of work together to promote uh, calcification. It's not necessarily just sort of one one thing. So, so what can we really do to um, to try to impact um, the vascular calcification that we encounter in the cath lab? So, you know, one thing that you might think might be possible would be, okay, well, what about some of our drugs that treat atherosclerosis? So, unfortunately, um, statins actually have not been shown to reduce calcification. In fact, it's the paradox of statins as they actually have, um, perhaps by um, reducing the lipid content, um, they do end up ultimately resulting in an increased volume of calcium. Um, although there's really no um, evidence that this uh, that this process actually this um, increasing calcification that occurs with statin use is associated with any adverse outcomes, at least in observational studies. Um, so, what about some of the other drugs that we use for um, hyperlipidemia, such as the PCSK9 inhibitors? Um, those have actually been shown to have no change in calcium composition of plaque, at least to date. Um, however, there's um, some limited data. Um, you know, this is this is relatively limited data from a, a small number of patients that it may limit um, statin therapy-associated calcification. Although, as I just mentioned, because we don't have any evidence that that necessarily um, impacts outcomes, I'm not really sure of the clinical relevance of that. Um, and then, azetamibe, um, which is another sort of commonly used antilipid. Um, it has no, no influence on statin-induced plaque characteristics or independently. Sometimes patients will actually ask me about um, this, this association with warfarin and calcification, so I, I 
put the slide in here. Um, I guess I'm getting this question less and less as patients are sort of um, fewer and fewer patients are taking warfarin. But um, there is there is um, evidence that warfarin actually does um, promote calcification essentially by inhibiting um, an inhibitor of calcification called MGP. And um, also vitamin K deficiency is associated with calcification. But there's again no evidence that warfarin um, actually causes any adverse clinical outcomes as a result of this increased calcification. So um, I uh, wanted to just um, talk a little bit about the bisphosphonates just because this also comes up. Um, you know, the patients who oftentimes need to receive bisphos bisphosphonates um, because they have osteoporosis oftentimes will have other risk factors for the development of coronary calcification. But it is thought that there is a relationship between bone resorption, perhaps, and uh, vascular calcification. Um, it's uh, the case that patients with lower bone mineral density actually have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned. And there are um, there there have been studies on various other bisphosphonates, um, atidronate, um, pamidronate, uh, alendronate, um, that that potentially, um, at least in animal models, they may limit um, vascular calcification. Although there really is not at this point sufficient evidence to recommend or or um, or to not recommend the use of bisphosphonates for vascular calcification. There's a few other um, sort of investigational drugs or compounds um, that are have been of interest. For example, metformin is an anti-diabetic drug that is associated with reduced coronary calcification, um, at least in animal models, um, resulting from a de decreased transition of vascular smooth muscle cells into an osteoblastic phenotype. And um, some senolytics, so senolytics basically refers to um, medications that might um, actually get rid of the senescent cells and allow the um, sort of non-senescent cells to continue living. Um, so some of them, such as dasatinib or quercetin, um, have been shown to reduce um, at least aortic calcification in animal models. So still lots of work to be done in that area. Um, and then um, uh, poly or um, ADP ribose um, polymerase inhibitors, which are um, essentially enzymes which um, uh, have an impact on um, DNA damage response, um, and an in inhibition of those of it has actually been associated with reduced um, RUNX2 expression, which is a transcription factor that uh, promotes calcification. So as far as future directions, um, I mean, ultimately, I think this kind of comes back to what we are already doing, which is, you know, trying to prevent the risk factors that lead to uh, vascular calcification in the first place. Um, ultimately, I think that it will be very important to kind of understand what are the most important factors that actually lead to calcification or potentially could um, help to prevent it um, or even um, potentially allow regression of calcification. That would be the ideal. Um, some of the things that our lab is, is interested in is um, sort of drug discovery, um, potentially think, looking at molecules that might activate inhibitors um, or reduce activators of calcification and potentially repurposing of drugs. Um, but until then, um, coronary calcification is, is very prevalent and it definitely complicates the management. I don't think I have to um, explain that to this audience, um, both in patients with stable and unstable coronary syndromes and um, prevention of coronary calcification is dependent on satisfactory um, modification of risk factors um, over the course of years. Um, but actually, we still really don't know that if we actually do reduce calcification, that it will be protective um, because ultimately I do sometimes wonder if um, if it isn't uh, there for a purpose, you know, perhaps we would have more aneurysmal types of coronaries if we didn't actually have calcification to prevent um, the vessels from stretching out from hypertension. Um, and ultimately, also, um, there's no current medical therapies that definitively reverse coronary calcification. So at present, we're really still left with managing the existing calcification through mechanical rather than medical strategies. And um, I still feel very strongly that we have to be adept at using tools to, to manage calcification for the foreseeable future. And um, this is definitely an area of my interest um, and uh, look forward to um, hopefully coming up with some strategies, but likely will involve having to, to target sort of um, younger and middle-aged groups um, before they start to accrue calcification. So thank you very much for your time. Nadia, that was great. Um, Simon and I have been trying to read our biochemistry books <laughs> underneath the table and pretending we know all about this. So thank you for bringing us up to speed. Listen, what I wanted to start with an easy question. So you've shown us a lot about how, you know, how vascular calcification develops and some of the multiple mechanisms, but why does it develop? You, you just sort of mentioned a, a start of a hypothesis there in almost your last sentence, but that strikes me as a really important question. Why, why do we develop vascular calcification? Why do we suddenly decide our bones are no longer any use to us 
let's get rid of all the calcium in there and put it into our vascular tree. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't yet have the answer to that question, <laughs> um, but I definitely do, you know, sometimes wonder if it, if there isn't sort of um, an evolutionary advantage to having some calcification, um, ultimately, especially with, um, with things like hypertension. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure that I can answer your question right now, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that it does kind of concern me. And I do think about that sometimes when I'm trying to think about, okay, how are we going to prevent calcification in patients um, so that we don't end up with these situations? But obviously there must be some point where it goes from being um, protective to pathological. Cause I mean, ultimately like, I'm not sure what, how useful a calcium nodule in your coronary could ever be. Um, so I think that we still kind of have to get at some of those questions. And um, in a way, it's very interesting too, because I think when you think about like a vascular smooth muscle cell that starts extruding calcium um, like crazy, like, you know, mm -hmm. there's definitely something pathological about that and almost like, um, almost like, like a malignancy or something like that. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's very different from malignancy, but um, you know, just the idea that you have a cell that kind of starts to go haywire and causes problems for, for its microenvironment. But it's such a systematic response, isn't it, to a particular mm -hmm. threat. And as you say, the evolutionary argument for biology is a fascinating argument. And I think but sometimes what we forget about evolution is that it's, you know, there is a time window in which evolution is really, really important when we're all reproductive. But of course, once we stop being reproductive, they don't care about us anymore. <laughs> that's what we, you know, that's what I cry myself to sleep about every night. <laughs> Nobody cares about me anymore. But it does leave us with these questions, you know, particularly with vascular disease, which is not necessarily a disease that you associate with high rep reproductivity, that actually it does seem to be some form of vascular repair that's almost, you know, gone wrong, if you like. Let me ask you a more direct question then. There is this strong association between coronary calcification and vascular calcification and all the risk factors that you mentioned in your excellent talk. Now, what you didn't really touch on was the dose effect. You know, is there, is there for example, particular risk factors which really accelerate vascular calcification? Um, so I definitely think that age is probably one of the most important accelerators. I mean, and definitely renal dysfunction, um, and then probably hypertension. Those are probably to me like the most, the three most important um, risk factors. But um, I mean, I think that it's very interesting because we sometimes will have patients who are, you know, um, much older who even have renal dysfunction um, or diabetes, and they and they don't have calcification. So there's definitely got to be you know, some um, genetic modifiers that allow, you know, some people to sort of um, uh, not not to develop it or certain vessels. I mean, that's the other thing that's always, you know, it's always a big question. It's like, why does the um, Lima never, you know, develop calcification um, or very infrequently? Um, does it develop calcification? Is it because of, you know, shear stress or, or mm -hmm. is there actually something that's biologically different about the vessel? Um, that leads to that. So I think that those are um, definitely obviously risk factors are are very critical. Um, and I, th I think that those are things that are modifiable, except for age for the most part. Um, but I think kind of getting down to like what allows some of these older patients to um, sort of uh, be able to um, not develop calcification versus, versus some that do. So if you have got a solution to the aging problem, Nadia, and maybe now is the time to share it, we can kind of let the, <laughs> let, the, let the world know. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I think that I know this is sounds kind of silly, but like, um, I think exercise is a really great way to prevent calcification because I mean, except for less, maybe not like to the extreme degree. Like, I think that there's definitely been some, you know, studies that have actually shown that extreme athletes um, actually have more calcification. Uh, but I think regular physical exercise is probably a big one. And then, um, you know, eating healthy, some of the, those things that we kind of all know and just have to remind ourselves to do. So me and James are also interested in that there's just two types of calcium or calcification that seem to affect the vasculature. There's the intimal calcification and there's the more medial calcification and there's a bit of overlap. They're quite different as well. My question would be, if, you, if we had to invest a lot of money in targeting one, what, 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 what's the most harmful? Where, where is the most benefit going to lie in, in, in future therapies? That's a great question. Um, and I'll have to definitely think about that some more. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, there's definitely a lot of overlap in terms of the risk factors that lead to both of those things, um, with intimal being sort of more like atherosclerotic versus medial being more perhaps related to um, sort of systemic um, 
metabolites and inflammation and uh, hypertension. So, uh, but I guess, hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure I could say that one is more important than the other. Okay. I think day to day in the cath lab, I don't know, what do you think? Which, which one is... I mean, in the ca if we were just lab. concentrating on the cath lab, we would we'd want to tackle intimal cath. It's, it's, yeah, it's intimal every day of the week. Because yeah. actually, sometimes the people with medial don't get coronary mm -hmm. disease and intimal calcification we know is intrusive and all the rest of it. But if you get the, that patient who's got a combination of the both, you've got the medial calcification that takes away your vascular compliance, mm -hmm. so therefore it's held to get equipment yeah. anywhere. And then you've got calcific disease you actually have to modify to deploy your stent. So that combination, which I think, Nadia, as you say in those slides, you can see that's the older patients who've got chronic calcific plaque and medial calcification, you know you're in for a tough day. Yeah. I was also fascinated about the, the statins. You know, statins do not reduce coronary calcification. You know, that's a fascinating thing that I didn't know about before. Um, as I understand that um, the statins increase the amount of high density calcium, is that right? Or what, what did they yeah, do? Yeah, so there's um, some um, intravascular imaging studies um, from the original sort of studies that looked at sort of moderate intensity and high intensity statins, um, such as Pravastatin, that actually demonstrated that there was sort of an increased um, volume of calcium. Um, and I think a lot of it probably has to do with, you know, you're definitely losing, obviously, the lipid pool, and perhaps it's just becoming more dense. Um, but there does seem to be also like an actual increase in calcification. And I have seen some mechanistic studies that tried to get at the reasons for that, but they didn't, to be honest, like make a lot of sense to me um, in terms of, you know, their sort of suggestions were related to um, sort of macrophages and inflammation and stuff. But I mean, I, they were suggesting, at least this most recent study I saw that the that it was increased inflammation, and I was like, that doesn't mean, that doesn't make any sense from mm. what we know about statins. Statins sort of reduce uh, vascular inflammation. So I have not seen any compelling um, mechanistic data to actually support the the reason for that, but it has been observed. So, so uh, you know, I think that the statins. If I saw an increase in vascular calcification in patients without coronary disease on statins, that would worry me more than the increase in calcification, which is essentially an increase in plaque stability in patients with coronary disease. And that does bring out this kind of interplay that coronary calcium doesn't always associate with increased plaque stability. Early on, it's decreased plaque stability, yeah. and then as it kind of becomes more congruent. So listen, Nadia, we're very grateful for your talk and your time and your expertise today. Thank you for telling us how to live forever. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And now it's Simon's turn to present to us. So Simon, what is a shockwave? Okay, thank you, James. Well, it's a pleasure to be involved in this educational series supported by Shockwave. My name is Simon Wilson. I'm a consultant cardiologist at uh, St. George's Hospital in London. And what I'm going to talk about or try and explain in the next 10 to 15 minutes is what really is a shockwave, what are the properties of a shockwave, and what we've learned about shockwaves from renal lithotripsy in terms of the mechanism by which they can affect stone or calcium fragmentation, and also the mechanisms by which they can potentially cause tissue harm. And I think if we understand these different things, then it really helps to explain why intravascular lithotripsy is such an exciting technology and we can really begin to appreciate what um, adaptions have been made to the technology uh, uh, for the uh, intravascular environment to maximize its uh, uh, efficiency or efficacy and minimize the risk of complication. And that's something that uh, Ziad's going to talk in a subsequent uh, presentation. So if we think about what is a shockwave, I think it's helpful to have a reference with, with which we're more familiar with, and that's the, the humble sound wave. So a sound wave is just an example of an acoustic wave, which in turn is just a type of uh, energy propagation or method of em energy propagation through a medium by means of compression and decompression. So if we look at the classic tuning fork, as it vibrates, it creates oscillating periods of high and low pressure. Um, as the uh, adjacent particles are first pushed together and then spread apart. So sound, therefore, is just really a repeating pattern of high and low pressure. And a shock wave is also a, a, a type of acoustic wave, but it has very different properties compared to an ordinary sound wave. And this is really visible when you compare the pressure time profiles of a sound wave on the left and a shock wave on the right. 
So if we look at a shockwave in more detail, the key characteristics are that there's a very high amplitude positive pressure phase or compression phase. And it's marked by an extremely rapid rise in pressure and a narrow pulse width. And this essentially creates uh, a period of, of abrupt and almost discontinuous change in pressure, density and temperature. And this is followed by uh, a comparatively lower amplitude negative pressure phase or tensile phase. Now the tensile phase, if you can contrast that to the compression phase, it creates pooling or stretching forces. And as we'll learn later, these are important mechanisms for uh, stone communition and also uh, tissue injury. Okay, so how are um, shock waves created? Well, a common, the commonest way or commonest method is when the, the source of the sound or acoustic wave is traveling through a medium at or above the speed of sound for that medium. And um, we'll be familiar with explosions or when a, or a fighter jet moving through the air. So as the speed of the um, object creating the sound increases, then successive compression waves traveling in the same direction as the object find it harder and harder to escape. And as we get to the speed of sound or exceed the speed of sound, these compression waves cannot escape from one another and they rapidly pile up, leading to a very high uh, region of uh, pressure through constructive interference. And at these very high amplitudes, then the normal laws of propagation are exceeded, meaning that the high pressure regions uh, travel at greater velocity than the low pressure reg regions, and this leads to progressive steepening of the pressure rise and the formation of the characteristic abrupt pressure time profile of a shock wave that we've seen earlier. Okay, so in terms of mechanisms of effect, we, we, we've known that, uh, or we've used shock waves to, in renal lithotripsy since the early 80s. And this really came about following the discovery that shock waves can pass through living tissue without causing significant injury, while being strong enough to disrupt hard stones. And this is really predicated on two key things. First, the elasticity of soft tissue allows even very high amplitude pressure waves of short duration to pass through without causing harm. And second, is that when a shock wave encounters a tissue interface, then disruptive forces are produced if there's a big acoustic mismatch. Or in other words, if there's a big difference in density between one medium and the next medium. So if a... Um, if you take water and soft tissues, they have very similar acoustic impedances, which allow shock waves to propagate through without causing harm. But when the shock wave encounters or travels from a, a soft tissue to a hard tissue or vice versa, then there's a big acoustic mismatch and so strong forces are generated. So in terms of the specific mechanisms of effect, well, what happens when a, um, a shock wave encounters the tissue interface? Well, in broad terms, part of that wave will be transmitted and part of that wave will be reflected. And this will generate uh, varying degrees of compression and tensile forces in both mediums that will depend on the direction and magnitude of the uh, acoustic uh, difference. So to specifics, um, we know from um, renal lithotripsy that fragmentation of stones or calcific tissue occurs due to a combination of compressive, tensile and other stresses. We've got a nice animation here. We can see an approaching shock wave uh, and as it strikes the, the anterior surface of a stone, part of that wave will be transmitted and this creates compressive fo forces at the front end of the stone. Next, as the wave continues to transmit through the stone, shear forces are, are produced. And then as it approaches the rear end of the stone, again, this is another tissue interface, so part of the wave will be transmitted and part of the wave is reflected. Now, because the wave is moving from an area of high density to an area of much lower density, the wave is not only reflected, but it's inverted. And this is known as the Hopkinson effect. And because it's inverted, there's a sudden creation of a large amount of tensile stress. And this has the effect of pulling the back end of the stone, creating a lot of disruption, and this process is known as spallation. Another force that's um, known to be uh, uh, cause stone disruption is squeezing. And really, in essence, this is because of the shock wave that's traveling through the stone will be moving at a higher velocity compared to the same shock wave that's traveling around the outside of the stone. And this creates a squeezing force.
And finally, there's cavitation. Now, cavitation is an important mechanism of stone erosion and also implicated in tissue injury. And essentially what, what cavitation is, when a, the trailing negative pressure uh, uh, wave or negative pressure part of this shock wave, as it moves through any fluid medium, it can induce cavity bubbles to form. And if those cavity bubbles are located in close proximity to a, a, a tissue surface, then they can collapse in an asymmetric fashion, leading to a, a microjet of high velocity directed towards the stone surface, causing erosion and damage. Okay, so there's beneficial effects um, that shock waves have in terms of uh, disrupting stones or fragments, and also, uh, but also shock waves can have harmful tissue effects. And these are mainly caused by cavitation or where there's a major mis mismatch in acoustic impedances. So, uh, as we just talked about, um, shock waves can induce cavity formation in any fluid filled compartment, which includes blood vessels. And this can, microjetting can occur, uh, causing the, the potential for uh, damage to the blood vessel or any other organ that contains the fluid. Um, now, very large acoustic mismatches typically or exclusively really occur when there, there's a tissue gas interface. Uh, and when this occurs, over 99.9% .9 of the wave is reflected and it will be inverted as well. So there's a generation of a large amount of tensile stress and this causes a lot of tissue injury, disruption and even perforation. If you compare that to example, um, to when a tissue, when a shock wave goes from uh, one soft tissue to the next soft tissue, only 1% of the wave will typically be reflected. And when it passes from a tissue to a stone, about 25% of the wave is reflected. Okay, so in summary, what we've learned is that shock waves are a form of acoustic wave characterized by a very high pressure positive uh, uh, wave of short duration. We know that shock waves can travel through soft tissues and across tissue interfaces of similar acoustic impedance without causing injury. But when they encounter a, a, a significant acoustic mismatch, then disruptive forces are pr produced, which we can uh, utilize to cause local uh, fragmentation of tissues um, to our benefit. So um, that's the end of the talk, and I'll uh, go back to the studio. Thank you. Great. Simon, that was a great talk. I mean, it sort of brought me back to school in some ways, a bit of physics going on there and the animations were lovely. So, but I guess the question that we're all asking ourselves is, why should we care? Well, I think, um, you know, for me anyway, if you understand the mechanism um, of any technology, then it really helps you to engage with that technology and more importantly, understand why that technology can be so effective. You know, it's just it's such a simple idea, isn't it? Taking some technology that we've known about for four decades that's effective for breaking up kidney stones, um, and now we're applying it to the intravascular compartment. So everything sort of makes sense. And I think if we just drill down into the actual mechanisms of effect a little bit more, then it helps to understand the, the principles of it. And also, you know, it's going to help us uh, understand where it's going to be most effective and what, and I know that Ziad's going to come on to this as well, what Shockwave have done to modify the technology specific to the vascular comp uh, compartment to make sure it's, to maximize its e efficacy and minimize the risk of complications. Yeah, and I like the, what you've done there, drilled down into the mechanisms. There's a bit of a play on words there. That's, <laughs> that was unintentional. That's great work. Yeah, yeah. So based on what you presented there, you said, well, understanding the mechanisms helps us understand where we're going to get the most effect out of the technology. So where are we going to get the most effect out of the technology? Um, well, I think understanding the mechanisms tells us um, you know, it's for me. What I took away from this is that it's clear that uh, this type of technology can be safe. You know, because the, the disruptive forces are just generated at regions of high acoustic impedance. Mm. So it's going to allow you to to, to, to deliver the shock wave through the tissues, mm. and then just specifically focus in on target on calcium. Mm -hmm. So and that's selective. quite yeah selective, and that's mm. unique to to the amongst the different modalities for calcium. Modi modification that we have. 
certainly amongst the balloon-based technologies. Yeah. So it's selective. Um, doesn't really, uh, I mean, it means it's going to be uh, 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 useful in all types of calcium, whether it's superficial or deep. Yeah. But I suppose we'd still need more studies to understand um, specifically where the, whether it's going to be most helpful in concentric calcium, which mm -hmm. we believe it is, or how we can use it or perhaps how we can adapt it in the future to deal with, you know, eccentric calcium or nodule calcium. That's, that's something that we'll need. Yeah. And as you say, the dose relationship is still quite unclear uh, as well. So, so just getting back to, again, to that mechanism of action again, and the selectivity of coronary calcium, how would you summarize um, how it affects the, the, the disruptive effect on the calcium itself? Um, well, I think I, I know that uh, I don't want to go too much into what Ziad might be covering. Um, but what we know from renal lithotripsy is that there's certain mechanisms by which it's effective. You know, there's compressive compression. There's this um, shear forces that are created. There's this spallation, you know, with the, at the, the back end of the stone where the wave is inverted, creating a lot of tensile stress. And there's squeezing and there's also this cavitation. And all those are important in, in terms of disrupting stones. But some of them, some of these properties are harmful, and that's particularly the cavitation mm -hmm. and also these tensile stresses. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a, a, a key difference uh, between intravascular lithotripsy and stone combination is that we're, we're, we're trying to we're achieve, the objective is slightly different. In stone combination, we're going to pulverize the stone so it can pass. But in intravascular lithotripsy, what we're trying to do is just fragment the calcium. We're not trying to yes. disrupt it. Mm -hmm. So um, that has allowed the technology, particularly the, um, the wave itself, to be modified uh, such that it delivers just compressive force mm -hmm. to disrupt the stone, but it avoids the complications of having high negative tensile stresses, avoids cavitation uh, induction, etc. So I mean, that's an excellent answer, Simon. And I've got another question for you because there, there, there's a, something very inbuilt in human to compare things. You know, we want to compare X with Y. We, we have a real relative judgment thing that happens all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you, and I've seen some numbers bandied around, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but if we think about the effects of barotrauma on the vessel, so we inflate a balloon, you know, and we can inflate that balloon from anything from 10 to even 50 atmospheres with an OPM balloon. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we use some of these very high pressure barotraumas, we, we don't use them unless we really have to, is because we're concerned at the effects on inflammation, medial trauma, and the subsequent kind of restenotic process that can be instigated by you know, severely disrupting vessels like that. Now, I've heard that the, the atmospheric pressure equivalent from a shockwave is a, in the region of 60 atmospheres. How would you compare what it could potentially do to the medial disruption to a balloon inflated to that level? Well, you, the pressure, if you just compare and say the pressures are you know, 60 atmospheres, that could take you by surprise and think mm. that's, a, that's a lot of force. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely a believer that we need to apply enough disruption to, to the, the lesion, whether it's calcified, to, to restore vascular compliance, because that's critical. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to just blindly apply massive amounts of force when we no. don't need to. So it's got to be a, the appropriate amount of force to achieve adequate vessel compliance. Because I do think that if you cre create a lot of tissue disruption, a lot of tears, there are studies showing that that is going to promote restenosis, as mm -hmm. you said. But the difference is that um, shockwave is targeted. Yeah. So the, it, you're right in saying it is 60 atmospheres, but as, as I hopefully conveyed in my talk, that the disruptive forces are only created when the shock wave goes through a tissue interface where there's a big acoustic mismatch. Mm -hmm. So that force is applied only around the calcium fragment. You know, it's not going to be applied to the soft tissues. And so it's, as we've said up before, it's selected, it's targeted. And that's, you know, that's the goal of anything, isn't it? Of course. Uh, targeted therapy. And that's what this really is. It's targeted to calcium. So it's not just a question of teaching the artery a lesson, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> it's teaching the calcium now. We can modify our talks, teaching the calcium a lesson. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Simon.
So it's also a real pleasure to introduce Ziad Ali. Ziad Ali is be well known to the audience as one of the major innovators in many fields of interventional cardiology. But perhaps what's less well known is that Ziad has actually been involved in lithotripsy since its inception. And I can think of no one better to ask about how IVL therapy is adapted to the vascular space. Ziad. James, thanks so much. Uh, you know, it's really meaningful for me to be involved in this mechanism of action talk because we struggled through a lot of this during the inception, uh, and it was quite a process to get here uh, 10 years later. So I get the fun task of talking to you about what's under the hood in IVL and how IVL is adapted for the vascular space. Well, shockwave is generated for medical use traditionally based on extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which as you know, is used for renal calculi. There are three main technologies that are used to generate shockwaves for external shockwave lithotripsy. The first one is basically a spark plug. A spark plug with two electrodes in which an electrical arc is created between the two in a fluid filled cavity, and that creates an unfocused energy that becomes focused based on a reflection from the ellipsoloid reflector. So that's unfocused energy that hits this ellipsoloid reflector, kind of like a flashlight focuses the light to go forward instead of spreading everywhere. Electrohydraulic energy is the important one because that's predominantly the one that's used in shockwave IVL. There are some other methodologies and that's electromagnetic. In an electromagnetic system for the development of a shock wave, you have a coil, an electric coil, and as that electric coil generates energy, it bends a membrane, kind of like a dome, just in front of it, and that creates a focused energy, which is then focused either by a parabolic reflector, like in the electrohydraulic, or by a lens that focuses the energy uh, into uh, increased amplitude. And finally, there's the piezoelectric crystal. So when you line up these piezoelectric crystals, which can also create electrical energy, um, and you put them together and activate them together, these piezoceramic elements can also create a focused energy. So this had to be an adapted to intravascular lithotripsy. And the adaptations required the placements of these emitters, which in this case are the electrohydraulic uh, mechanism, into balloon catheters that could be used in clinical cardiology in the vascular space. And there are three, the integrated balloon, the C2, the S4 and M5 are used for peripheral while the C2 is used for coronary. Now these have different properties. The M5 actually gives you up to 300 shocks, the S4, 180 shocks, and the C2, sorry, 160 shocks, and C2, 80 shocks. You'll see on the right side, the generator, which is a relatively uh, simple looking device, but with a lot of work under the hood. It's connected quite easily to a catheter with a button on it that activates the energy. And then of course, the balloon is at the tip. Now, what we're gonna do is go through some of the adaptations that have allowed us to use this device intravascularly. The Shockwave IVL incorporates several adaptations to this re regard. And we're gonna talk about the energy flux, density, and waveform modification, how we're integrated into an IVL balloon, and then of course, the emitter alignment. So let's start with the adaptation from the waveform energy. This is the hardest part. So in green, what you see is the energy waveform of an extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy for kidney stones, for example. And what you'll notice is that very early on after a shockwave is generated, you have a very high peak pressure followed by quite a substantial negative pressure and then sort of what look like some aftershocks. What you'll notice in the inset is a blue shockwave IVL energy pattern. And when you look at that in the context of the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, you'll notice that the magnitude is significantly decreased. And while it may seem that you can just turn down the dial, it's not so simple. And in fact, that requires a tremendous amount of engineering so that you maintain safety, but still have enough energy. 
And if we look at this table on the right side, you'll notice that some of the energies for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy are very, very high indeed, and simply inapplicable to any vascular space. A peak positive acoustic pressure of 300 to 1100 atmospheres, peak negative acoustic pressure of 80 to 150 atmospheres are simply way too high to be used internally inside the vascular space. And you'll notice that moving from focused energy from the extracorporeal system to the intravascular unfocused system allows some dissipation of energy and the peak positive pressure is much more akin to things that we would try to achieve in interventional cardiology, interventional vascular therapy. And that is 50 atmospheres of positive pressure, very little negative pressure, and I'll talk to you more in detail about why that's important. Peak negative acoustic pressures around three atmospheres, and then a penetration depth, which is three to seven millimeters, covering the vast majority of the vascular space. You'll also note there are many primary mechanisms of calcium fracture in the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, but the intravascular lithotripsy largely relies on compression stress. So what happens is that the integration of these uh, technologies into the balloon could lead to heat. And so one thing that needed to be engineered was to make sure that we weren't creating charring or very high temperatures during the arcing that could actually lead to a biological response within the artery. In fact, this was the first question that we received from some of the funding bodies that were approached very early on in the inception of IDL. But what you'll notice actually is that the temperature changes with each cycle of 10 pulses is really very, very small. And within the standard deviation of, of even one degree Celsius. So temperature is really not a factor and thus heat injury of the vessel wall is really not an entity here. The next thing is of course, mechanical stabilization. Well, obviously if you take a balloon and you undersize it so that it's floating within the lumen of the artery, then the energy that's created will be dissipated not only into the wall, but into the liquid interface, in the movement of the balloon within the artery itself, and thus energy will be limited to get into the vessel wall. By sizing the balloon one-to-one -one or 1 1.1 to one, you'll notice what that does is stabilize the balloon to put it directly in contact with the calcium, and therefore allows the energy to be transferred more directly through its shockwave into the vessel wall. It's important to understand the different emitter alignments between the different technology used in peripheral and coronary IVL catheters. In the coronary IVL catheter, there are two emitters and the emitters are placed four millimeters from the radio opaque marker of the balloon. Then that's the first emitter, then six millimeters followed by a two millimeter gap and the radio opaque balloon, a uh, marker of the balloon. That's important because it's a little bit more difficult to see the emitters than the radio opaque markers. And what you want is to have the emitter immediately adjacent to the maximum calcification because you notice in red, this is the field effect. The field effect is largest immediately perpendicular to the emitter itself. Now the C2 catheter has two channels. The S4 channel um, catheter has four channels, but the M5 channel is rather unique or a catheter is unique because the middle channel receives its own source of energy. And that's why you see a larger field effect. And in fact, this will provide you the highest amount of energy towards a calcified segment. So what are the effects of IVL on vascular calcium? We've done important experiments on heavily calcified cadaveric superficial femoral arteries by performing both CT and microscopy, allowing us to examine exactly what's happening to the calcium in vivo and in vitro. So here in this situation, in a heavily calcified SFA, 180 IVL pulses are performed. And following those pulses, you see that this leads to fracture of the calcium within the vessel wall, further fracture as we deliver more energy. And then when we look at these under micro CT, you'll see compared to the baseline, on the bottom panel in B, you see multiple different fractures. And this is highly relevant 
Because what we're used to seeing on the optical coherence tomography images are longitudinal fractures in a cross section. But of course, this is unfocused energy. And what you cannot see in that situation is things such as chips of calcium or calcium fractures that may not be happening completely in the axial plane to the OCT. This would be analogous sort of like delivering energy and blowing the roof off of the house. You might not be able to see that, but nonetheless, the damage would have been done. And that is a mechanism by which uh, the efficacy of IVL may be underappreciated with regards to visible fractures on OCT. And this is evidenced more by histopathological examination. When you look at low um, power magnification histopathology with hematoxyl and eosin and compare it to the CT, you see these cross sections of fractures suggesting that these are actually occurring both in vivo and these are not just artifacts uh, on um, CT examination. These fractures can occur in multiple planes because of the unfocused energy. And again, this may be one of the mechanisms by which we have greater yield of the vessel wall compliance compared to the visible fractures on OCT. What about the effects of IVL on soft tissue? Well, this is a study of, histo uh, of eight pigs in which uh, the pigs underwent 180 pulses of IVL at four atmospheres, followed by the recommended balloon angioplasty at four atmospheres and had a histomorphometric analysis. This is a nice randomized control trial in the sense that the comparator plain old balloon angioplasty compared to IVL shows that there's almost no difference in important healing metrics for the vessel wall. There's no difference in the injury score, inflammation score, endothelialization, or neointimal smooth muscle cells. And the disrupt CAD 1, 2, and 3, and 4 have provided insight into the mechanism of action in vivo and shown repeatedly that calcium fracture leads to an improvement in vascular compliance and as a result allows us to expand stents circumferentially and uh, further provide luminal gain. And this is evidence of that where we look at the pool data from disrupt CAD 1, 2, 3, and 4 we notice that there are shifts from the pre-procedure to the post-IVL, but this shift is really pales in comparison to post-stent, where what happens is the yielding of these tectonic plates as described uh, in the next slide. So you'll notice again that there is a fair increment over time in this data from Disrupt CAV3. And this is what I was mentioning earlier on. In panel A, you'll notice that calcium fractures occur early after intravascular lithotripsy. But once you place the stent, these gaps or box patterns actually yield significantly further, creating further expansion within the vessel wall. In panel C, you see a single linear fracture in a segment of calcium that's less than 180 degrees. But you notice that the stent is expanded radially in the non-calcified segment but a large gap is created where the stent pushes these two tectonic plates away. We also know in follow-up studies by OCT that fortunately that this space fills with neointimal tissue and not recalcification. When we look at the effects of IVL in the peripheral artery system, the results from clinical trials show that one-year patency rates are significantly better if the optimal technique is used, i.e., to have an IVL balloon sized one-to-one -to, -one to maximally allow the field effect to penetrate into the vessel wall and also to use something called pulse management, which makes sure that you're delivering energy to all of the calcium, not only the most calcified segment of the vessel. So in summary, this technology has been integrated into a semi-compliant balloon through a lot of very careful engineering. The acoustic waveform has been specifically adapted for vascular calcification through a lot of sophisticated engineering, not as simple as just turning down the dial. IVL is safe on soft tissue because these acoustic pulses are soft on soft and hard on hard. The impedance of water and soft tissue are actually very close, but the impedance differences between liquid and hard bone or calcium are magnitudes different, which allows these differential effects to occur. As a result, 
IVL has the ability to modify superficial and deep vessel wall calcium without the need for high pressure inflations. An appropriate balloon sizing and technique is associated with improved outcomes. You must have enjoyed this journey that you've been on with IVL therapy and there's a real reward at the end of it when you see a clinical applicability and I think we were talking offline before and is it is it true that the inventor of Shockwave has even been treated with his own therapy? That's a that's a really nice uh, story to share. Uh, John Adams, who's really um, you know the brains behind IVL, uh, is someone who worked on this diligently, worked on a lot of the engineering to work on the energy here, and then ultimately because of heavily calcified coronary arteries, um, went to the UK to have treatment on himself and had a dramatic improvement in symptoms whereby he wasn't even able to walk a few steps when he came to London at the airport to get to passport control, but the day after his procedure was climbing the London Tower. Yeah, imagine controlling your own destiny with your own invention. It's fabulous, isn't it? So listen, I mean, there's, there's a lot of great stuff in there. I wanted to ask you specifically about the goals of therapy. Now we talk about restoring vascular compliance and I feel in some ways we're slightly, slightly hamstrung by the way we assess vascular compliance. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that, the how we use, what surrogates we use for vascular compliance and your thoughts around the dose effect of IBL. Sure, um, great question, James. Well, first of all, uh, where we're sort of fooled is with the non-compliant balloon expansion in severe calcification. And the reason for that is because if you don't have greater than 270 degrees of calcification, the balloon will expand radially towards the path of least resistance, which is the interface between the calcium and the soft tissue. But as soon as you take the balloon down and you put in a scaffold, it will not hold that same compliance. In fact, there's a very high chance for recoil. And so what has um, IVL has really allowed is the calcium fractures dramatically improve the ability to circumferentially expand the vessel wall basically with a stent. And, and really when we look at the OCT stub studies of all of the disrupt series, the one thing you note is the more the calcium, the greater the fractures. And the greater the fractures, the greater the ability to create those gaps between the calcium fractures leading to an improved minimal stent area. So we're essentially using the anatomy that we can see uh, on imaging, calcium fractures as a surrogate marker for vascular compliance. Is that fair to say? And, and as you said, James, the problem with assessment of vascular compliance is we don't really have tools to do that in vivo. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, expansion of a balloon and behavior of these devices is probably the best we have at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and actually it's not too different from what we do in other areas of intervention. For example, we use stent area as a surrogate marker of physiology. And of course we can, we can still measure physiology, but that's largely what we do most of the time. Simon, I know that you've spent quite a bit of time on uh, the mechanisms of action. What struck you the most about um, what the Shockwave company has done to bring this therapy to market safely? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, you see the histopathology slides and you say, you know, a, a picture say, a, as, a, as it says a thousand words and they're just so impactful, aren't they, to see that the, the, the fractures both superficially deep in cross-section, etc. But what, you know, from this uh, whole, you know, um, topic that we've been covering regarding the mechanism of action is the way that Shockwave uh, or John Adams has taken an existing technology um, and applied it to vascular space. It's sort of a, like a light bulb moment, isn't it? We, 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 why did we not all think of it? You know, um, and technology that builds on existing technology is always going to be have the greatest chance of success. So taking that technology and then adapting it in terms of modifying the, the, the waveform, that, that's the key thing that you, that as yeah, I talked about how, I mean, it looks easy, doesn't it? Just turn down the volume, but, but adapting that specific to the vascular space and 
because it's completely, it's, it's different, you know, it's not an external shock wave, it's an internal thing, so you require less energy, as we've said previously, the goal is not to pulverise the calcium, it's just to fracture it, and by modifying that and realising what our objectives are, it's it, it being able to, um, you know, maintain efficacy, but also minimise harm. So th that's, the, 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 you know, that's an amazing I mean, achievement. You know, Simon, there, there, are, there are certain subtleties within this, for example, the spall stress, which is the negative yeah. stress that you get when the shock wave hits the back wall. You know, that's three atmospheres. If, if it was 50, we'd be seeing a lot more perforations. You know, we'd be pulling the calcium in from the adventitial space. So, you know, there was challenges along the way. When we first started, every balloon would burst, right? You can't put that amount of energy into a plastic balloon that's you know, ultra thin, it bursts every single one. And you, you need to sort of work with the electrical engineers, work with, you know, the balloon developers and the prototype developers to figure out a mechanism by which you can create uh, this energy within the balloon, but not burst the balloon. Hmm. Um, so th there was a lot of interesting challenges along the way. Also how the electrical energy is in series, um, rather than that was a, a eureka moment because Originally, there was one wire to every channel. When you have one wire to every channel, all of a sudden the catheter becomes very, very thick. Yeah. So th there was a lot of you know fortuitous um, uh, things that we noticed along the uh, along the way, but also really a lot of hard work from a lot of people to bring this to um, commercial use. And and Ziad, I think there's a truism in there that every successful journey is full of dead ends and failure. And actually, it's only a failure when you don't learn from it. So let me ask you to turn your gaze from this incredible journey to the future. So, you're, you, you know, Chalkwave are now looking to increase the applicability of the device in other areas. Have you any thoughts on what we might see in the future? Well, I, I think like with any um, company, there needs to be iteration in the device to meet the needs of interventional cardiology. And what are some of the ongoing needs where calcium in particular is problematic? One is in chronic total occlusion PCI, especially for the proximal cap being able to penetrate. Uh, others areas of course is valve preparation for very severe calcification within the valvular space. Another area is when it's just not enough energy the calcium is too thick and that we need more energy to be able to create calcium fracture, but at the same time, main safety and not create harm. So these are some of the areas where I think that this technology can be further adapted uh, to help patients. Can I ask Ziad, um, is there different types of energy or energy profiles that are more effective in different types of calcium, whether it's nodular, thick plate, superficial, deep, uh, or is it, is that something that's too nuanced? Well, I, I don't think so. The, the biologist in me says no, because this is unfocused energy. The balloon expands, the energy is delivered unfocused from two diametrically opposed channels. So the first channel faces one direction, the other channel faces the other direction. And so the energy is released and it will go in a circle because the balloon is holding the artery in a circle. So that's why you see more fractures with more calcium. In a nodule, if a nodule covers you know, 30 degrees of arc or 40 degrees of arc, you're only getting 40 divided by 360 of energy entering into the, into the nodule. So um, at the moment, I think that the unfocused nature is a major advantage. And as you say, maybe when, you know, if emitters were more aligned or there was more energy, there's a potential to provide more targeted therapy. Uh, and that, that those could be things that are in the cards in the future. Well, listen, Zia, it's been fantastic. And when the, as you say, it's been a journey. We've enjoyed hearing about this journey today and the future is looking very exciting. We'd like to thank you for your time and wish you the best of luck in your, in your new career. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much, James, Simon. Great to see you all. And that's about all we have time for this week. But don't worry, we have a packed program for you with Class 5, Eccentric Osteo Lesions, Focus on Best Practices. Class 5 will feature Julian Strange talking us through calcific osteocoronary disease 
a different challenge. This will be followed by a live case from Richard Schlofmitz and Alan Jeremias from St. Francis Hospital in New York. And finally, Carlo DeMario will tell us how to treat eccentric coronary arterial calcium. Until then, goodbye.